Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining in. Uh, we shall start our webinar in uh, five more minutes. Um, so we planned at seven to start. So we should be good to start at seven, or maybe let's say plus or minus two minutes. Uh, so quite interesting to have all of you here. And uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining in uh, who are here live now. Uh, I think there are some more people who are going to join in short time. Uh, so uh, whoever is joining in, um, by the way, thanks uh, for joining in the webinar. So quite interesting to know that you know, you're interested to learn about EVs and possibly you're also an sustainable mobility enthusiast, uh, quite happy uh, to, to share this an opportunity and you know share a time with you to uh, know more, like you know, share more about EVs at the today's webinar. So I think before everybody joins in, uh, uh, let's try to know each other a bit more. And you know, if you could just let me know what interests you to take part in this webinar and what interests you about e-mobility and maybe what exactly you do. Uh, are you a student, you're a graduate, you're working somewhere? Uh, because we found uh, people attending from other countries as well. We found people from academics and a lot of people from industry who have enrolled for the uh, webinar. So about, I think, 1,000 plus students nearly enrolled for the webinar. So uh, quite happy to uh, have everybody here today. So just let us know what interests you to take part in this webinar. And by that way, I'll try to focus my topic and discussions uh, towards that. But the rest apart from it, we definitely have already a planned content. That is surely something we can deliver uh, to bring some insights on this. Okay, so um, maybe just use your chat box. I think uh, we don't have to waste our time and, and you know, for waiting other people to join in. Uh, so just, just use uh, your chat box to let us know, you know what you do, uh, what possibly your background of uh, you know, uh, studies or work exposure is, and what are you trying to expect out of this webinar. So we will have it more focused uh, in that direction. So yeah, so we're waiting. So just drop in your messages on the chat box there uh, in the live chat box. Um, so we will have a continued discussions. Awesome, so we already have one person, his name is Nakul, uh, automotive engineer, final year student, uh, going to do a final year project in EVs, fantastic. That's a good initiative, Nakul, and really appreciate uh, you doing it. Um, definitely, it's something uh, quite good to work on projects because that is something you know we do practically in, in engineering, I think, you know, real world applications, I say. So definitely, it's a good thing you're taking it up. Uh, take it very seriously and you know, try to implement uh, as much as uh, things possible. And maybe if you implement uh, it, uh, try to have it more in detail and deeper. Okay, so uh, to find out, okay, so we have Darshan J to find out uh, what will I need to learn more about competitive to be in the industry as a job seeker. Awesome, that's good to know Darshan. Uh, that's definitely the need of our because currently the hiring has been going chaos. And you know everybody is struggling to start their career, and you know industries are also only hiring for people who are you know uh, multi-skilled and multi-domain expert because they could save the resource costs and stuff like that. I think that's a challenge. So having planned your career, you know what you want to do, and picking up your skills before you graduate, I think it's very very important. That's good. I'll try to see what best I can add there. But I know the system is very big. Uh, we'll try to see how best we can you know, uh, provide the information. So uh, we have uh, Shiv Pratap, uh, what projects that can help us to grow in the AV industry? Okay, that's quite good, quite good. We'll try to discuss that. And uh, working on battery calculations for my project, I'm not quite good with it, already done some basic courses in our community. Sounds good, uh, uh, Um, So if you are very serious about what you want to do, definitely you could take up something on level two that would possibly help you out. Uh, we need uh, studying third year mechanical engineering, completed EV projects, and I want to learn more. Awesome, fantastic. So good, I think focus something. If you already learned at one level, focus on industry sides. 
I try to see validation part of it. Uh, that's what is very, very important. Try to see how industry is following procedures, uh, learn about standards, uh, learn about testing standards, validation standards, learn about specific tools that industry is using. I think that's what you should do, you know, if you're already gone into one level. If you're starting from scratch, start from scratch, you know, don't jump into the, uh, you know, the mid of the ladder. So start from the beginning, but if you have already gone up two ladders, like, you know, two, two steps and, and just know what is the next ladder, you know, clearly that it could just make you best use of your time and, you know, utilize it best for your learning purposes. Uh, so we have Siddhant. Hey, good to have you back, Siddhant. Um, we, we know quite well each other. So you've taken up already uh, courses at Decibels. Uh, I'm quite happy to uh, host you back today. Awesome. So guys, let us know. Uh, I think we should start our webinar in a few more, uh, uh, I would say, minutes. Uh, we'll just wait. It's always like that, right? Seven is never a seven, maybe. <laughs> um, I think it's it's quite normal nowadays that, you know, okay, let's join a little late. It's okay. Um, so quite, I'm quite happy for people who have joined on time and much before time, and I really appreciate your uh, interest uh, to attend the session. Uh, thanks a lot. So guys, let us know if there is anything more. I think I should take another two, three minutes and uh, we should be able to start the session. So want to do specialization in mechanical system integration with DB, also interested in how to determine the work. Okay, awesome. So the world is very interesting. Uh, system integration, yeah, quite good. I'm happy that you, know, you have the direction into a place, um, how lithium and, and motor works, cool. Okay, so I think you can, so there, there is a community co courses available at Decibels. They're free, you don't have to pay for it. You go to Decibels website, join the community, you get three courses. There is enough content on uh, lithium ion cells and things like that. So it, it could possibly help you. Something more you want to learn practically, building the models and stuff like that, you could take up on level two courses. Um, providing technical service for battery and uh, charge station, very interesting. Rupaj, quite happy to have you here. Um, that's good to know uh, you're already in a sector uh, with a specific thing. So excuse me for a, uh, 30 seconds here. I was just going to grab a small cup of water. Um, so just drop, drop your messages more to know and you know we will have it more interesting to discuss the topics. I'll try to focus uh, towards your direction. And let us know what department of engineering you're studying, you know, by that way, because my, my slides are in such a way that I'll try to focus, okay, which department of engineering works here, like what is the scope of, you know, uh, uh, learning for you and engineering for you and things like that, okay. So Drew Drop, which department of engineering you're studying so that, you know, uh, it, it's quite easier for me to focus and stress more on that area. Okay, so um, automotive engineering, good. So guys, let us know maybe which department of engineering you're studying or if you're already working, which industry you're working, what sector you're working. Okay, good. So mechanical engineering, mechatronics, automotive engineering, good. Awesome, thanks a lot. I think it looks like um, that's not still a fair amount of information to, to just start with. Okay, so we have automotive, a lot of automotive guys and the mechanical. Awesome, so good to know guys. I think I'll have quite happy and thanks a lot for you know dropping in your uh, details. Um, quite interesting to know mechanical design analysis, uh, automotive. Great, fantastic, so good. So thanks, thanks a lot everybody for just joining in your dropping in your details. Uh, so that gives me a good direction to you know, focus some of the topics and you know, have it interesting for you. So cool. Um, okay, let's start ahead. I would just like to start with a topic here. This webinar is, is not, I would say like uh, very advanced at this level because I we are starting it to have a solid idea and foundation to gain understanding of components in AV. And I'll try to, to 
to focus from my perspective and my experience on, on complexities of these components, okay? If you're expecting a very high level topic and definitely I, I wouldn't be doing uh, uh, it today because they have upcoming webinars where we'll be touch basing on battery testing, you know, uh, uh, system level engineering on the part range sizing and need for simulations and stuff like that. So that's my focus today. The Tori's focus is to understand subsystems in an EV, okay, as defined in the uh, uh, name of the webinar itself. So uh, by the way, welcome everybody, everyone back again, and thanks a lot everybody for joining in. I'm quite happy to have like-minded people who are you know, interested in sustainable mobility and trying to focus your career also towards the electric mobility sector. So the objective of today's webinar is to understand the components of electric vehicle and where I'll try to share some like in a direction to engineers and you know what they can focus on and what departments and divisions are there and we'll, we'll make it exciting in that way. So so uh, I'll just like a couple of slides about decibels. I, I, as I say, I'll, I never take much time here because I know you're here to learn technically. Um, so we, we are one of the you know amazing e-learning platform uh, focused to electric mobility and automotive segment and very much practical learning content. So we've had, we had about 8,000 users uh, in the last uh, six months. We've had, today we have about 17,000 students who have enrolled for 17,000 enrolled courses and we have about 1 million plus hours of content watched. So keeping everything this away, so we've been serving uh, a lot of uh, OEs and startups uh, in areas of consulting and also in the areas to uh, you know, provide learning solutions to. So this is our, uh, you know, uh, uh, like people who have participated, uh, engineers who have participated in the courses at Decibels and also we are you know, uh, 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 approved vendors for uh, a lot of OEs in India uh, to provide uh, knowledgeable training on the areas of EV pattern simulation, specifically in MBDs. So yeah, uh, now to say, uh, definitely there's a lot of university students also taking up our courses, not only in India, even students from other universities as well. So this is our core team, and uh, that's me for the first uh, who is delivering the sessions today. Uh, so I'm Suraj, uh, and thanks a lot, everybody, for giving this opportunity to share the knowledge what I have. Uh, we are a government of India recognized startup, and we've been extensively helping a lot of uh, uh, industries, set up labs, and also universities to focus on what is required for EV than just assembling some components and you know, trending that this is an EV and you know setting some differential, this is how the way it works. But we've been trying to focus <clears throat> very deeper uh, into a tech of EV, making them understand what they should research than actually what is not just uh, visibility of a component into a place. And this is how things has been focused for quite a while now. And after the lockdown, this has totally moved into an online learning. That's how the LMS platform has came into a picture. So what is the webinar flow for today? So this is a webinar flow, what I'll be having for today. I'll, I will focus on all the subsystems and I know I may not be able to touch base every bits and pieces of it, but as in majorly, I'll be touch basing on all the components into a place. So uh, we'll try to focus on traction motors, transmission, motor controls, uh, traction batteries and thermal management challenges and battery management systems, and also EV charging and conductors, contactors, fuses and more. So by this way, it, it, it sort of, start to give you an understanding you know maybe there's a question from a mechanical engineer what i can do in motor controllers you know is it something really really relevant for me and motor controllers yes if i tell even the mechanical engineer has a functionality in motor controller design but how we'll, we'll try to figure it out i'll show you some of the real-time cases and you know, uh, make you understand what components and engineers would do and what could be an involvement for a electronic guy Right, so what would be an enrollment for an electrical engineer in motor controllers? And maybe if you go to, go to you know, uh, because we have seen a big transition of IC engine to an EV, we are still seeing a transition, I would say. And like what the engineers were working on engine design, engine calibration, you know, uh, uh, engineering of a system, maybe if it is air intake, exhaust, uh, fuel management, what are they going to do? You know, maybe the people working in the design segment, what are they going to do? So there are areas we're trying to focus. That's, that's how the interesting way I'll try to keep the session engaged into our place. So I would request you to be as interactive as possible. If you ask me more questions, I can give you a deeper insights. If you let me just run through the slides, I think you would have very limited information. 
because I'm not trying to do this webinar just because I want to share. I think I would like to help people to get a direction into a place into an EV because the motivation for me is, you know, when I was back in the US, uh, so we went to universities and, you know, we interact with a lot of colleges. I, I had seen like, you know, lab facilities, testing centers, you know, deeper researchers, validation equipment back in there, you know, uh, uh, I would say 10 years and things like that and eight years and things like that. So, and also when I look back into a lot of data, people are working extensively on validation of EVs, you know, back in the US and, and a lot of EV test data is also available nowadays because of those tests. So it, US Department of Energy has been extensively focusing and investing more on that. And that's why like, you know, they have amazingly trained engineers to, to work in those areas in, 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 in the place. But when we're back in here, so we, we may not have that good curriculum still available. I think IIT just as recently introduced one of the M tech degree. It's quite, quite challenging, honestly, to get a well-trained engineers into an EV sector. I mean, without a good engineer, how can you expect the ecosystem to grow, right? So there is tech required, and I understand from the economic perspective of it on all of these things. But if you don't have good engineers, I think you'll never be able to improvise an ecosystem into a place. So that stuck in my mind, and then I felt like, okay, let's push some engineers into the sector and you know, have them you know, get into it. I know it's just not easy because I'm telling, you know, you learn something and you're going to start your career. If everything was so easy, everybody would have just learned my webinar and not taken the course into a place and, and joined the EV industry. It is tough, it's definitely tough, and it's nothing is straightforward, you know. It, it goes through a way. So that's my motivation to take part in this webinar. Do drop your messages, you know, what uh, motivates you into this webinar. So I think already people answered those questions. So if, if anybody is there and uh, what interests you to take part in this webinar, I'll try to keep it focused to those people and focus to those questions. So do type in your uh, you know, inputs in the chat box. So let's start with the first thing, you know, what uh, components are there in EV? Um, so these are the all components which majorly covers up an EV, okay. It looks like a dark block diagram, but, but that's pretty much what is there in an EV. Uh, it would be a uh, hypercar, supercar, daily using car, uh, simple scooter, commutable vehicle, it, it would be anything, okay? It could be anything, but at the end of the day, what is there inside an EV is most of this. Maybe at a hypercar, you could have like a motor set back, motor set front. So if you have two motors, obviously you have two controllers and maybe you would have bigger battery uh, system level uh, and integration is different, that's it. But, but if you consider at the end of the day, that's what there in EV. But the problem is, it is not so simplistic to just design these components because these components are very sensitive to certain parameters. If you take an engine, it was not very sensitive as as a battery, right? And, but the problem is the batteries are very sensitive to temperature and a lot of other parameters, they get, they get a memory effect. So it, it requires a complex approach. It, it is complex uh, system into a place in understanding, but looks very simplistic. So let's start out and understand what these components are into a place. So we have, uh, let me just use some of these markers and uh, have it uh, quite good to understand. So let's say we have uh, a motor and a transmission, right? So we have transmission, we have motor. So typically in EV application, we tend to use uh, AC motors. Uh, so uh, that's basically uh, uh, majorly the ones just used and typically PM motors, that's permanent magnetic motors have found a, a deeper possibilities because of uh, you know, weight to power ratio, efficiencies and compactness, uh, all these things into a place. So people are trying to explore other motors like non-PM motors because of dependency on uh, rare earth materials such as magnets. And that also creates a dependence on certain countries that is not good, we have seen in recent days. There are researches going on extensively also in, in except PM motors into a place. And, and also like some industries has been you know, made it possible I think that's going to be a one more interesting area too. So that motors and then transmission. So typically most of the uh, EV application, the transmissions are uh, uh, quite smaller uh, and we do use transmissions in EV because it could help us in optimizing the motor sizing and also optimizing the operating points of the motor into a place. That means you can improvise an efficiency and things like that and optimally size the component of a motor just into a smaller space. So you won't see a <clears throat> A motor which is more than three four kilowatts which is a hub motor because of two challenges you you would make a very big uh, a wheel because you can't package that power requirements into that small wheel and that will possibly you know affect your vehicle dynamics 
being a wheel size and also weight on the wheel, and that's going to be a problem on vehicle dynamics and suspensions and things like that. So you may not use hub motors extensively, but you could possibly use a non-hub motor configurations itself. That's cool if you're using a scooters and stuff like that, but possibly if you're using a cars and other applications, you will possibly use non-hub motor configurations because you might have seen like Audi's platform, Porsche's platform, Jaguar's platform, and all this uh, Chevy platform. Those are all like non-hub motor configurations. And that's what you see in the industry, which is coming out. So this is going to be an on-off motor configuration and you will have transmission. So typically in EV application today, people are trying to have like single speed, multi-speed and possibly also planetary gear system. And that's what you see in, I think Jaguar F-Type, they introduced a planetary gear system and also Audi's uh, introducing planetary gear system. And, and that's the way possibly the transmission uh, segment is moving into place. So we have transmission, we have motor, I'll run through some of the images and you know interesting topics into a place, but right now we'll, we'll fix into that. So we have inverters, which is uh, uh, into a place where it could help us. Yeah, I'm sorry, just uh, wet some issue on my screen. Okay, so we have uh, inverter, so that is uh, going to be uh, a component which will be you know uh, uh, helping to. Uh, run the motor. So the functionality of an inverter is very simple that, you know, it, it would control the motor uh, in terms of its torque and speed. It's just not one of its functionality. It's, it's one of its functionality, not everything, because uh, there are a lot of other functionalities what uh, uh, motor control also handles. We call, we name that as a uh, inverter here, right? So uh, then into a place uh, as coming to the areas of uh, um, um, in what, I'm sorry, just excuse me for a second here. Just my screen is behaving a little odd. I'm not able to see the cursor. It is just going here and there. One second, everything is. Okay, sorry about it. Yeah, back now, uh, it's all great. So when you come into our areas of inverters, uh, so that's basically uh, this one. So it, it, it is there because you, you have a DC source and uh, now you, you have a motor, which is an AC. So you need to, you need the DC to be converted to AC. So that's why you have a motor controller also called as a traction inverter. Then apart from it, that's like basically converting AC to DC, DC to AC. And then you have functionalities such as an RPM control and torque control out of which there are many other functionalities. I'll try to run through my further slides to give you an understanding. Then we have a battery pack, which is, uh, uh, one of the major element of an electric vehicle powertrain. And then we have onboard charger to help us charge the battery. And uh, we also have offboard charging option where you could do a DC fast charging, and this would be a slow charging. And then we have a DC DC converter uh, for all your auxiliary load condition, auxiliary load requirements. And then we have a battery management system, which is basically a device, which is electronics, which to control the operating operation of the battery and keep it safer and also help us in many other functionalities such as safety, observation, monitoring, estimations, and things like that. <clears throat> so apart from a very important element, we also have heater and slash cooler, okay? So if you see, uh, this is majorly all the components which come as a part of the any electric vehicle part rate. Let it be any, any vehicle, right? So that's basically your drive in it and then your drive control uh, battery, uh, then like your power electronics such as uh, onboard charger, DC DC converter, and uh, offboard charger, and every systems for a part of uh, battery management systems, <clears throat> and the battery itself, and then your thermal management system. The thermal management system is not just limited to the batteries, but it is also like to require to cool your onboard charger, to cool your DC DC converter, to cool your motor controller, uh, to also cool the motor in cases. So those are all the component functionalities of a heater that would possibly come into a picture. I have a small video here that just briefs you through some of the components in reality. So a uh, credit goes to A2Mac and uh, they're the amazing uh, benchmarking platform uh, where benchmark many EV vehicles and release the data. 
and it is available for all of us out there. You could, you could visit Atomax platform and that would be a great way to get some very in-depth information. So visit YouTube channel of Atomax and you will be able to get a lot of these videos and gives you some better understanding of the components. So that was just a block diagram and uh, I was just trying to show a transition from a block diagram to a, a vehicle level information. So that was an example of one vehicle and here you see another example of Audi. And typically, like as I said, some vehicles have two motors, some vehicle have three motors, uh, two motors at the rear and one motor in the front. Audi has some configurations like that. It totally depends. It's architecture design, how uh, system level engineers want to make a decision into a place. So what it is requirement for the scalability, requirement for the modularity into a place. And, but rest of it, like if you see, most of the OEs would go for a battery pack flatbed, and that would be coming all over the, the floor panels. And then depending upon your architecture, like if you take Nissan Leaf, I'll show you through. Uh, so that's, that's typically all the components. You have your motor, transmission, motor controls, then your battery, uh, onboard charger, and then your DC-DC converters and, uh, and I would say uh, heating system and cooling systems into a place. Let's run through uh, some of the other slides here and trying to understand what more components are there. So um, the why I'm showing all these things is you know, it gives a better visual perspective of understanding what components are there. Because I meant that this also webinar is trying to focus on the career scope, because when you see those components, you would possibly get a perspective, oh, this is something I could do as an engineer, right? If I'm from a mechanical perspective, okay, hey, what components are there where I can design, where I can involve in design, right? Where if there's a power electronic component, say this is my area of interest and things like that. That's why I'm trying to focus more towards the images and gives a better perspective of understanding into it. Let's start with the dry units. And uh, the dry units can be very simple um, as this, okay? And um, so like, like something like this could be an Aether uh, dry unit. They have uh, a motor, which is BLDC. I think they are moving towards PMSM in the upcoming days, possibly. Uh, like with the configuration, and they have a single speed gear reduction and directly connected to the wheels into a place. It's such a simplicity, right? And if you take a completely vehicle to this, maybe a Prilla or like, you know, a 125cc uh, Active Honda, any of those platforms, I, I still not compare because Aether has better performance than them. Um, but still comparing to that, you can see a, such simplicity of a powertrain design, right? You need to run through a lot of CVD configurations and stuff like that, but it's, it's, it's more simplistic in its nature. And also it could go more complex uh, as we go on higher the sizing. So higher the sizing means if your powertrain size becomes more and more and more, the system also becomes more complex and complex and complex. So it is not that you know you could just build a three kilowatt platform and then possibly tomorrow you can scale up that to a 30 kilowatt platform, a 300 kilowatt platform. It is going to be own complexities at a place when you want to scale up the platform. There are challenges at, at, at component level when you want to scale it up. But yeah, so that's a very simplistic overview of what Aether was uh, showcasing into a place. But if you see here, Audi has uh, the way they have structured their platform. So if you see that's modularity concept and also scalability concept, where they have sized their powertrain in a way that you know they could use it in the various drivetrain requirements. Maybe like Audi A3, A4, A6, A7, or A8 or something like that, right? So they could just package the components in the right way. So depending upon that, they have put their uh, powertrain like drivetrain configurations. So this is what you see in all the parts of the uh, drivetrain in Audi. Now what you have to focus right now here, you know. I just can run you through the same, but it's just the same components into a place. But what you try to see here and understand that, you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, okay, what components I should be involved in designing, right? So if you see the transmission is still there, that was there in EV2, uh, IC2, but the, the complexity of transmission has been reduced. Maybe the number of gear ratios were like five, six, seven, also like recently. But now if you see that the transmission size has been reduced, but still the transmission is there. There's a good scope for transmission engineering design. And that is in terms of transmission uh, uh, MBDs, and our transmission controls and those areas into a place. And apart from it also for a core of design, 
It could be CAD design because all these components, basically most of the components of casings or castings. If you go to a gear design and you know maybe other component design which comes as a part of this uh, transmissions, are there a scope for the mechanical engineering? So the design is a very big product life cycle, right? So you start a concept design, you go to CAD design, you go to validation, that's possibly your CAE or CFD or NVH. Then once everything is validated, so you go to your manufacturing simulations. Once your manufacturing simulations is passed, then you go to your tool, tool design. Once your tool design is done, like in a tool, like completely tool manufacturing, then your alpha, beta, gamma prototypes, and then your production, and then your quality control, all these things comes into picture. It means like, you know, that cycle is not killed. And there is a scope for mechanical engineers in those areas and traction controls and transmission controls are the control areas for a, a, a embedded system engineer to see an opportunity is even there too. And obviously the area of development of sizing of part frames would be good on the MBD side. So there is a good scope for MBD uh, in part frame transmission design, right? So, and coming to the areas of motors. So uh, in a motor for attractive application is very complex in its nature. So what I meant is it, it's just not so simple that you, know, you just can take a motor and assemble to an EV application because one thing is it, it has to be very compact in shape, compact in design. It, it should have a higher weight to power ratio. Then it should be very efficient in its nature and it should be durable and it should withstand all that atmospheric condition, you know, atmospheric challenges. It should also take up a lot of uh, 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 vibrations and things like that. So it has to be very, very rugged in place. That means uh, you can't just use your daily application trans you know, motors for automotive applications. So it, it requires a very special design. So now you could see there's an extensive uh, development towards the efficiency of motors. Like we're talking about 98% efficiency motors or like 97% efficiency motors for automotive applications. That means that is an area of focus for electromagnetic studies. There's areas of focus for uh, 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 motor materials. There's areas of focus for, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, way you could do the uh, cooling of the system, way you could use the space better and, and packaging of the systems. Like that is where there's a lot of core research in the areas of uh, materials, magnetism, and you know, uh, uh, design uh, for, for like you know, thermal challenges. That's what there is a core you know, work going on in the areas of motor development. So that's a scope for a core of electrical, ele electrical guys. And, and that, that has brought up a lot of interests for people and, and yeah, definitely that involves a lot of MBD and thermal analysis and on various other areas into our place. And magnetism studies, uh, various tools are used and that's a good scope for uh, engineers from you know uh, electrical background to pursue some of the options there. And because we are not talking just like numbers of efficiencies, we're talking very, very deeper numbers of efficiencies into our place. So, uh, I mean, these are some images. I just wanted to kind of convey that, you know, uh, Look at a component, see who does that design of the system, see where you fit it in yourself for the career opportunities. And by that way, you, you could you could possibly focus your rest of your studies and you know possibly upskill yourself to enter into a specific area. I know it's it's still like on the fly, but but it you could start at some point. That's what I'm trying to say. And this is another image of a Zoe part frame. What I'm trying to focus is like, you know, that's all the components, you know, there, there is no uh, reinvented thing, right? So the motors and packaging of motors and transmissions in a simplistic way. And then we have power electronics on the other side. So coming to the areas of uh, type of motors, that's what we are seeing as a trend in the industry. And that's what we are seeing trend in the industry of transmissions. But this, this course, like this webinar is trying to focus just as a names, right? But, but if you're trying to see yourself as an engineer, and you know, like why single speed transmission? Okay, what would be the effect if you implement a two speed transmission? Okay, what would happen if you do a planetary gear system? And that itself is a huge, huge research study for every vehicle part and packaging. Maybe it's just not technology, maybe it's a cost, maybe it's the availability of components, maybe availability of engineering within the timelines. A lot of these things come into a picture. But, but that's what we focus on our other level three programs and level two programs to study each component, the component and understand, okay, if you implement a single speed transmission, what can happen? Okay, what should be the gear ratio? How to optimize the motor operating points by using a right gear ratio selection? How do I possibly optimize uh, uh, components, operating points of a motor? How do I enhance a 
even if you improvise a 1% efficiency by right selection of gear ratios, that could impact uh, energy consumption into a way deeper level, way deeper level, right? Because imagine if, if your motor efficiency is improved by 1% over the lifetime, and that is going to be a lot of energy savings. You're just not doing energy savings at a battery. You're also doing energy savings at a grid, right? And that, that means overall you know, improvement in carbon uh, footprint reductions into our place. That's, that's what we're talking. And, and uh, this webinar is just trying to give you names, but, but going deeper is, is your possibilities into a place. So, and then uh, the other things, if you have any questions regarding this, you can just use my chat, use the chat box, live chat box, put your questions there. I'll try to answer them maybe at mid of the sessions or possibly at the end of the sessions into a place. So don't hold your questions. Uh, as I said, be interactive as possible. So by that way, the session goes great and interesting for all of you. So we have Pranay. So how do you model the battery aging phenomenon in a multi-physics environment? What environment would you suggest to model? Uh, is avial fire environment recommended for 3D CAE, uh, then get the model, 1D model into a simulator? See, uh, Pranay, right now, what, what possible uh, things, what we have. So you could definitely integrate a lot of things, maybe from the thermal perspective of it, uh, cycling you know, aspect of it, and you know, maybe vibration aspect of it. So right now, what we're trying to study is, is definitely through, uh, I would say, tools like MATLAB. So they have, they have extensive libraries and extensive possibilities to solve things. So yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to use right now. And apart from it, yeah, you could, you could definitely have specific tool benches like GT suit has tool bench and also Ricardo has tool bench. There are various tool benches. I think you could look for the capability for each tool bench and what if you're trying to solve and then possibly you could, you could, you could use on the platform into a place. <clears throat> um, let's go on to the next topic. That would be a drive unit. That's basically a motor controller. So a typical motor controller, this is a Nissan's a Nissan Leaf motor controller, which is visible. I got it from OKNL uh, research laboratories uh, publications. So you could see it's, it's more of the power electronics and more of the embedded systems into a place, right? So uh, more of the power electronics, because obviously you, you have a functionality of a power conversion. So you, you need to convert DC, which is in the battery to a AC to a motor. So obviously you need uh, functionality for power electronics. And then you have to make all these uh, motor control algorithm to work, right? So the motor control algorithms is like, is like a one hell of a thing. And that requires a multi-demo and expertise in terms of uh, 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 knowledge of motors, knowledge of controls, and our knowledge of all the subsystems into a place uh, at a vehicle level <clears throat> to work on. So that is a very good area of interest uh, for our model-based design engineers uh, to work for MBD. Then obviously anything which is embedded with the driver softwares and you know uh, uh, obviously that comes with the CAN um, uh, protocols and, and all these things. That's where a good focus for electronics engineers uh, for, for the software side, for the control side, and also for a design of PCBs, uh, design of boards, and you know comp select component selection, uh, component sizing, and and then overall uh, for the power electronics side too, uh, I all all put into together place. There's a mechanical engineering guys could focus possibly on thermal management of the systems, and also uh, they could focus on the packaging design of these components, and then obviously the mechanical enclosure design of these components into a place. And this is insane uh, as we are trying to see that and this is simplified view of another vehicle. So if you see here is like an extensive list, but I, I would not say this is extensive. There could be a lot of functionalities as similar to this uh, as a motor controller. So you can see power conversion, as I said, and then apart from power conversion algorithms, that's a core of motor controller functionality. It could be different types of algorithms. Today we have extensive research going on in the areas of motor control algorithms. <clears throat> so, because that is becoming a very necessary thing to have everything configured rightly. So, motor cooling, uh, reverse control, regenerative control, diagnostics, safety interlocks, modes, and voltage and protection. Like, except this, there could be many other uh, functionalities for the motor controls, but I'm just listing down some of these functionalities. So, this is where, like, you, know, you talk about diagnostics. Obviously, we have uh j1192 i think so that uh comes as a diagnostic functionality so you should know the fun functionality standards then you know the implementation of this functionality uh, diagnostic requirements 
that that's another different area into a place if you talk about safety that's a different area if you talk about modes that comes into your area of uh, algorithms then protection of the systems and all these things are are, are a quite interesting topic uh, for a motor controls side of it then the traction batteries so i think yeah it's, it's a very extensive and a deeper topic to discuss but trying to limit myself as as in today's focus so uh we don't get cells in uh, our own sh you know, the required shapes or things like that. Or maybe not every company is so big in volumes to develop the cells which they require, right? In terms of the shapes and formats and things like that. So they are available in specific shapes. There are OEs like LG, A123, Panasonic, um, maybe uh, the bigger suppliers uh, as an extensive list. So they could only make those cells in, in terms of what, what quality of automotive requirements are. So in order to have to buy those cells and you know put them together into a stacks of modules and then build a battery pack into a place. But the complexity of this is imagine like there are 7,000 M8 volts or M10 volts and try to imagine if you can put all of them together and weld them together and make them mechanically integrated together. And try to see if you apply a load and that load can withstand that, you know, uh, your structure which you have built. It's very, very complicated, you know. That is when the packaging becomes a challenge. And it's just not a mechanical system side and the, and the one part of it and also thermal challenges. So the battery is very sensitive to temperature and, and it could go bonkers if you do not rightly maintain your temp the battery temperatures. So it is very critical. First, mechanical integrity of cells is a biggest challenge. Then with that mechanical integrity, you need to keep your thermal integrity of the system also as well. That is the, the, the challenges. And then the vehicle like automotive application have a lot of NVH and that becomes another big challenge to have, not just for a one time, but a, because it's a repetitive use for a, over the span of years. And that is, that is the challenges in terms of the battery pack design. And, and obviously thermal is a very uh, critical thing. And, and typically as in thermal, uh, it is also essential to have uh, a mechanical integrity and obviously a good amount of uh, studies for the NVH. So the packaging uh, battery is, is a core of mechanical engineering and, and you know, ensuring all the system kept into a place as a mechanical engineering. But again, the safety comes into a picture. That is when we have electronics into it and you know, uh, where we have BMSs at each module possibly, and then usually at each modules, and then you have a one master BMS communicating to a all of these packs into a place. So uh, these are some of the images what uh, uh, Audi would have put across as a package. You could see all like the, it, it's just not one component, right? So I was a seating engineer at Chrysler, you know, we, we uh, I would say Fisher Dynamics where we supplied uh, seats for Chrysler. So we, it, it, it used to take us like three, four years to completely develop a product, you know, and deliver it to your customer. It's so much which, which is goes into it. And similarly, now that was an element for the mechanical requirements. And also we had some electronics for the adjustments and stuff like that. But it used to take three years. Now imagine this is something mechanical, electrical, electronic, thermal, everything comes into a picture, right? It's, it's a multi-domain approach, uh, which is required to be developing a right back battery pack. And it's just not very easy, right? To just scale up, you know, it, it's not like, you know, you build a two kilowatt system, hey, tomorrow I'm gonna build a 20 kilowatt system, therefore tomorrow I'm gonna build a 60 kilowatt system. And if, if that system was so simple, I think we would have just like, you know, uh, made it all possible. But the challenging thing is a system becomes more and more complex. There are more unknown problems when you make a, like, you know, a whole system to work together, or, uh, scaling up the systems into a place. There could be thermal issues and they lead to a challenges. There could be electrical issues. There could be integration issues. Mm -hmm. So many things. Uh, uh, that's where people, uh, our industry is trying to work through. Uh, everything is a challenge, you know, every domain. It could be designed uh, mechanically, thermally, electrically, and, and everything is a challenge for sure. Uh, what, what we are trying to face, because a lot of unknowns, you know, no, nobody had developed a 100 kilowatt battery pack for an automotive application long back. Nobody have a data what goes wrong. You know, nobody knows what could be a critical parameter to consider for the failure. Uh, it, it's all we're trying to figure out right now and, and see to build this documentation for the future validations. So similarly, I'm just having some images here to give you an idea how different battery pack are there in different applications and how uh, OEs are trying to package it. That was an example of you know, a Tesla. This is an example of Audi and this is an example of Sunleaf. 
they're using their own type of cells, you know, uh, because that's an availability, competitiveness with the vendor, technology improvements in their own areas which they've researched upon, very many things. <clears throat> then we have heating and cooling systems. So let me take some questions here. It looks like uh, Ricky has a question. Is hybrid efficient than electrical vehicle? Um, I would not say uh, hybrid is efficient in, in because there are many ways to you know, identify efficiency. Um, so, but if you ask me, you know, uh, pump to wheel, you can't beat electric. Okay, so you've got to understand what is the difference between pump to wheel, well to wheel, all these things. So if you want to compare uh, hybrid to uh, an IV, so yeah, because motor is like about 95% efficiency, inverter is about like 95, around 90, 93%, average let's say 90% efficiency for all the system. I know conversion loss around 20%, but still everything put together, you really have competitive efficiency at EVs. You, you can't compete pump to wheel. But if you compare well to wheel, yeah, there are questions that need to be analyzed, but it's still better uh, competitively. Today's scenario, what one should expect in BMS? Oh, there's a lot to expect in BMS. Maybe I have a slide, and I, I would say that it's still a very primitive slide, but there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, things in BMS. So maybe wait for a while, uh, Prem, uh, you could get some answers for that. Now, uh, what are the recent challenges in thermal management of the battery and other subsystems? Okay, that's what we are trying to enter into. Uh, Aditya, maybe we could just wait and see through. So cooling and heating systems into a place. So cooling is just not only for a battery. Somebody have to understand that. So the motor requires cooling and uh, motor controller requires cooling. Onboard charger requires cooling. Your DC-DC converter requires cooling. And all these systems does require cooling, right? Because you know the motor's efficiency depends upon its uh, RPM torque and its temperature. So if you are affecting uh, temperature of the motor and letting it to go above its parameters, you're losing all the efficiency. And that, that is going to con like, you know, pull more current from the inverter and inverter is going to ab again, obviously work at higher loads and that's going to consume more energy. And, and then your battery going to have to pull up, push up more energy. You're just basically creating uh, 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 like chain of activities into a place, right? and amplified at every stage in, in, in like a sort of a, a ripples in the water. So it's very required, very essential to understand a system level, all the components and considering into it, what is the effect on the part when you try to size a component? Because that's what people are trying to see, right? If you see Tesla, they say, okay, this is a matter of a kilometer and they have beaten it competitively in a place because that is where like system engineering comes into a place. So talking about thermal management system, so traction battery cooling. So you could see this is some of the, the data I've taken it uh, from one of the, the, I think it's a recently the Porsche platform which somebody has analyzed. You can go to that website, uh, peakresources.com. They have very good analysis of the uh, Porsche platform on, on all the components into our place. Like how, how uh, each system is consuming, how they are designed and stuff like that. So the cooling has become an extensive challenge at, at battery. So first of all, identifying where to cool the battery. Now, is it at a tip? Is it at a, a, a round surface or a flat surface? Is it at the edges where the temperature is increasing? Uh, is it uniform? Is it ununiform? And how do you extract that heat? And then how do you dissipate that out of the system? I, I think that's where, that's where we require to study, perform a lot of CFP analysis. Uh, and then get to know and maybe do a lot of real-time testing of the batteries and see how how actually the batteries does uh, behave with respect to load, with respect to aging, maybe with respect to cyclic life, or say calendar life, and maybe with respect to various atmospheric conditions which has been subjected to. Like this way, it, it needs to be studied. The moment you have data which, which backs up your you know, the, the research or, or studies, it becomes sort of more accurate into a place. I think that was questioned by somebody. So coming to areas of motor cooling. So again, you don't have too much of space. First of all, you're trying to uh, snug in everything into a smaller space and you don't want your cooling system to consume a lot of space. So that's like your motor cooling uh, uh, packages into a place. Right now you see all the motor cooling uh, 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 areas. This is a 
credit by Audi and uh, that's a major center of ice. And you see another area of uh, cooling requirements for a motor controller and also the charger center in near. So uh, obviously power electronics produce heat. I'm just trying to focus, you know, where, uh, uh, you know, I would say your uh, possibilities to get a job, you know, thermal management system comes into a picture, mechanical system design comes into a picture. That's the enclosure. Somebody has to design all these things. So uh, looks like any questions. Um, what are the recent, okay. Uh, difference between designing a formula electric car and a commercial uh, vehicle race car. Um, Shubham, I think quite an interesting thing, you know, uh, you got to understand what is your driving pattern. Let's start at that point. You know, if you want to know what is an electric race car is, what is it like an average, other daily using a drive car is. So if you see the application point of it, right, just for a racing application, you have a track, it is a defined way it is driven, correct? Okay? and you know the parameters to control. But if you take an application of you know, general EV, so it's just like, you know, there could be a, a load extra on the vehicle. Maybe there are, you, you know, there's only one driver, right? But possibly it is not that there's only one driver. You know, there are possible situations. It, it can be like two people on the scooter. It can be three people, fantastic. It can be four people. You know, what kind of road conditions? We don't know. We can't measure all the road conditions. So you have to study for uh, RDC cycles, like real-time driving cycles. Uh, it could be factors heavily influencing the atmospheric conditions. And there are factors which is about NVH and things like that. I mean, a lot of these parameters are way different than a race car and uh, I would say a road car uh, because the application is totally different. Right. And maybe the power ratings of the components are totally different. Like, you know, because when you're driving a race car, you're always flat out. And possibly that the, the only thing you want to do is press the accelerator, hit the best as possible uh, at your top speed into a better, better acceleration system. But you don't drive the same way of your day-to-day uh, -day vehicle. So all your powertrain is totally different. The way cells are selected, the motor is selected, the cooling is done, controls are done. Like it's it's totally different compared to uh, 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 daily using uh, electric vehicle. So NVH is noise, vibration, and harshness. That's what NVH is. So what simulation software used in thermal analysis, battery, and other subsystems? Thermal, so obviously there are uh, you know, legacy software which has been used extensively already in the industry, uh, like an ANSYS, and there are various new softwares also introduced, even the tools like GT and Ricardo and maybe AVL, they also have inherent capabilities uh, and uh, there are some cost small uh, at different requirement studies. There are, there are software, you know, you can check uh, analysis of thermal management system or the battery, you get a list of softwares, you can look for that. Certificate, we don't provide certificate for webinar because what do you do with that webinar certificate, right? So it's just a piece of paper and you know, you deny attended the webinar. We don't provide certificates for the webinar, it's only for the courses. So, uh, yeah, so which software can you use to simulate a real world use of EV or planar graphs or acceleration and voltages? Kaushal, so uh, there are softwares like you could use um, one second. Um, IGP Car Maker is there. You could use IGP Car Maker and uh, MATLAB also have the workbench for uh, uh, drive cycle creation. Uh, if you do not have a vehicle, and obviously if you have a vehicle, I think you know if you're asking this question, uh, what you can do, right? So uh, yeah, if that's pretty much the question, I believe the session, like a webinar is going on well. I believe it is useful for you. And I believe it is giving some direction and to utilize your time um, uh, and what efforts you're trying to, what your involvement you're trying to show in here. So, um, do we have a, do we have a drive cycle data for motor power consumption, battery energy capacity? I mean, yeah, we definitely have, and that's something I can surely, if you if you ask me, uh, uh, do we need to have a drive cycle data for motor power consumption? Uh, okay, I think maybe you can just put across that question in a bit, bit better way. I could I could try to understand and answer that question. And also, yeah, you could take part in the need for simulation webinar that I think possibly is planned on maybe, I, I'm not sure, like Wednesday or Friday. You can surely look for that. 
So battery management system, let's move on to the next topic. So obviously the batteries are sensitive and uh, obviously uh, uh, hazards and, and stuff like that. So I mean, nothing is so safe, right? I mean, you, we are using LPG in our house and it, it's like it's it stored at a pressure and things can go bonkers if, if nothing is kept in the right way. So it, it is dangerous and, and nothing is so uh, you know, better in, in any shape. So you have to, because you have electricity flowing all over the house and if, if definitely there's a mess up and things are going to go bad. So what we do as an engineer, so we try to ensure a safety for the system. We try to design a system that it falls under uh, a protection, right? So we have regulations, we can try to meet them. We overpass regulations sometimes because regulations are not still up to the mark. So yeah, by that way, sometimes even passing regulations, there are challenges because it is a dynamic system. You never can expect it to behave a flat or a static way. So yeah, cell is very, very, very sensitive um, if you do not keep it better at its own operating ranges. So <clears throat> you can't do much if it is a cell level problem, if it is a chemistry level problem, there is nothing much a BMS can do. It, it just like, you know, totally no. And also like, you know, it's not always BMS is responsible for everything. And I think I would say like, you know, parameter of uh, requirement would come about like, 40% to 30% contribution or maybe about that for a cell level safety. But there are to be a hardware safety, there has to be different uh, parameter safety for a cell itself. Then the BMS comes into a picture. <clears throat> so um, yeah, there are the functionalities. Uh, if somebody was asking me about, you know, uh, what all the functionalities is there in BMS. Oh, it's just not extensive list. That's what I could say. There would be a lot of uh, other functionalities what a BMS could do. I've just listed down with what I can, uh, which came into my mind quickly. Um, so you can, you could just run through it. I don't have to sort of, you know, rephrase all these names into a place and you could just also understand them what, what are these names are. I think it's visible to all the people in a uh, better way. Or are, are you able to read these uh, names, I believe? Uh, yeah, I think uh, at 780p, you could read all these, uh, uh, what I say, uh, uh, texts which are getting displayed on the screen, yeah. So that's that's an extensive list of uh, functionalities, what uh, uh, a BMS is doing. And it's, it's, it's something like this. You have, again, different architectures in BMS. And that's an area of interest for, uh, for an even machine learning engineer that's an area for, area for interest for AI. And it's also, I mean, 100% the control system engineering and battery expertise and embedded systems. And uh, I would obviously, it, it's sensors, uh, signal processing, uh, everything into a place, right? So so that's that's because it contains so many sensors, it contains, it controls actuators. Uh, you gotta have a lot of codes going in to do estimations and stuff like that. So yeah, and in terms of the charging, so uh, I, I would not run much because I, I think you know you guys are getting an idea of what is there in the EV. So I'm just trying to have a, a quite overview picture for you. So it's uh, in in charging. So we have two types: one is onboard charging and offboard charging. So onboard charging is 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 very uh, I would say limited in terms of how much you could harness uh, the grid energy. Because in India, we have like, uh, I think, uh, publicly available sources about uh, 220 volts and 16 amps. And I think at, at certain commercial grid outlets, yeah, there is definitely different values. But but what is available for your socket is about 440 volts at industrial supplies. So you, you don't have like, you know, very big amount of power available for you to charge your battery quickly. That's why onboard chargers are quite smaller always. So onboard charger is something very supply and AC. And the onboard charger converts that to DC, uh, regulates the voltage, and take care of the charging process. Again, there are a lot of protocols which comes into place to ensure the safety of mechanism. Like it doesn't mean that you know just connect a charger, it all going to work. So there are a lot of protocols and functions, safety challenges, and communication things which happens before the charging process even happens. And if there is a fault in the system, the, the system has to disengage. That's that's a lot about uh, 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 to discuss. If you're interested to learn a bit about charging, uh, go to TI website, 
just type it in chargers. There's a good, very good videos available. So you could use them. Already they have done an effort. So you could use them definitely. And if you are part of our LMS, uh, I'll try to share the links for you so that you can just run through them. So DC DC converters. So why do we need DC DC converters? Because all your auxiliary systems, you, if you take a PV passenger vehicle segment, the, the voltage is about 12 volt, right? If a CV commercial vehicle segment is about 48 volt, sorry, apologies, it's 24 volt. So you have to you give that you know use that architecture, and because that's the rating of the components which we've been using for. You're just going to change everything. It, it's it's going to be very challenging to you know make systems to work. So people are talking about 48 volt architecture also for a low voltage as a consideration for all your auxiliary loads, maybe like a heating, cooling, and all. But I think that is not still standardized. So majorly just 224 volt architecture. But the batteries we discussed, right? Like about 800 volts in Porsche Taycan. So you, you can't you, you can't just supply that 800 volts to your auxiliary units. So you have to step it down and then supply it to the home components. That's when your auxiliary load, uh, like a DC DC step down converter, comes into your picture. So apart from it, yeah, these are some of the components, which is like conductors, contactors, fuses, and obviously many more components into a place, uh, which comes as a part of the EV. So now you got a comprehensive uh, understanding of components in an EV, but the only thing you have to start focusing now is like you know where do I fit myself? You know wh where is that? part of my skill sets, my domain of uh, exposure will come into your picture. I think you can't just decide that just by a webinar, you may have to extensively spend your time. You know, it's it just before you start a project, you do uh, a research, right? Like, you know, a theoretical research, uh, market study, and, and then you take a decision. It's just the same way. Don't judge them into something that may not be a focus for the industry, that may not be a need in the industry, and then you know, industry may not be hiring a fresher for that role. You take like a high voltage safety. I mean, it, it's not possible like you could, a fresher could be hired for all those things. It, no, it's not for the validation purposes. It, it, rarely freshers are hired for those things. So you have to know what domain, what role does the industry offering? And then for that, can I prepare myself into it? And yeah, I, I think I could I could answer a lot of questions, but, but yeah, I, it, it, it is a very big, uh, 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 thing to decide upon, okay, to give you a career guidance uh, because I could tell something, and if you focus on that, then what can happen for tomorrow? So it, you need to spend some more time before you make a decision. That's what I mean. It, it means that you need to talk to people, you know, check out list of openings in LinkedIn, uh, follow all the start startups and OEs in electric vehicle segment and LinkedIn pages, see what post they put for a job role. Keep following some of the EV industries, see what job roles they're trying to post and list down like, like extensive list of uh, skill sets they're asking for. See where do you fit? That, that's what you should do. And then actually trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowing where do we start. So by that way, you, you start to gain a momentum and, and try to become expertise in some areas and uh, having knowledge of all the systems. And that's how you could possibly uh, think about starting your career. <clears throat> so that's pretty much what I wanted to cover up as as an overall uh, subsystem in an EV. And <clears throat> I, be, I be, believe this webinar has given you some understanding in terms of uh, what components are there and also where you possibly can, can fit yourself. I think what would be your area of interest can be. So as I say, it's, it's very vast, it's, it's very extensive. So uh, spend more time. Don't just jump in and start something and then you re realize, okay, that's not something I wanted to do. Uh, spend more time before you start something and you know, uh, uh, keep working on things and, and do a lot of projects, involve in practical activities and, and be in touch with the industry, uh, find internships. Uh, I think by that way, uh, you, you could possibly explore opportunities. And if you're at institution level, demand your college to set up some small labs and you know you could start experimentations, understand the experiments, you know, because you have to be competitive. Nobody's gonna garland something in this situation because it's so tough and we are, we're not expecting to recover another, uh, I would say at least one and a half year, uh, totally out of current uh, financial uh, situations. So, and hiring will be slightly difficult so if you are competitive, if you are better with skills, that's the only way you, you could be possibly landing in something as a job. 
So start preparations, you know, put some time and, and um, so you could be better off with uh, future opportunities. If you're seriously planning for uh, your career, so you could definitely uh, go into Decibels website. So you could, it could go some of the courses that are available with Decibels. Uh, we just started one of the batch today. I think nowadays we are training more people from industry than actually students because they're realizing, uh, they know what is the need at current level. So they're quite happy with it. You could also see um, some of the students getting placed. So yeah, work courses, this is something as we call them as an internship, end of the day, it doesn't matter. It, it's just a, a namesake. So the learning is same. So if it's a professionals, we call as a level one, level two, level three. If you're a student, we call it as an internship. It just benefits in a better way. So these are some programs which may be better, better and beneficial for you. So um, and to start ahead with. And uh, yeah, let me just share the screen. I think it was not possible. So yeah, so you can just go to Decibels website. We have extensive, yeah. So we have a extensive list of, uh, uh, I would say programs available here, are very focused on model-based design approaches. And uh, yeah, they could start from professional uh, EV uh, course. So yeah, <clears throat> which you could see there. Um, and yeah, this is something you can start, but you know, if you want to know and just as a beginner, you could just take up uh, a, a, our community membership. It's free, it's not charged. You get three courses and the three courses are fantastic. And you know, you could, you could just gain some momentum in that area and then you know, push yourself if you feel comfortable to, to learn further in the areas of uh, uh, EV systems. So yeah, let me not just drag too much in here. I mean, it's not a core sales I want to do. I and mean, if you want a direction, definitely we could provide you. And, and definitely all the courses are decibels are live. They're not recorded in, in, in programs that are specifically in EV. And yeah, if you're interested, there is a space for you to learn. Okay, there are some questions. Let me just take them for another three minutes and we can find up. And guys who are leaving, just share us a feedback. You know, if, if it helpful for you, if it was good for you, and uh, you you did like the session, you know, was that something useful for you? Uh, that keeps us motivated to come back and, you know, add up some more sessions in the future. So, yeah, uh, let me just take some questions here. Which software are used to suggest uh, mechanical engineering uh, students to enhance their opportunities and skills? So see, I mean, it depends. It's a design, it's a simulation, it's a manufacturing simulation, it's a, all these things comes into a picture. I think that's what I meant. You know, you gotta spend some more time. It's not one. Uh, it's it's many things, right? You know, if you wanna do a thermal simulation, that's different. If you wanna do a FEA, it's different. If you wanna do uh, NVH, it's different. And if you wanna do a mold, like a manufacturing simulations, like casting, mold flow, forging, it's different. So you gotta spend some time in understanding what, what exactly is that. You know? That's that's what I mean. Trying to get yourself a little, little bit more to another domain. So, best way to get drive cycle data for Formula Student Car? Hmm. I mean, I know it's difficult uh, to get it. Like, try to see if you get an AGP car maker. You could you could try. Or you, could you also write some programming in MATLAB? You could also try getting it. That's the better way. That's it. So what is the difference between accumulator or a battery? Uh, no, there is no difference between that. So as I understand, it's just the same. If the controller has inbuilt DC-DC converter and DC converter, do we need to have individual converter separately? If controller has inbuilt DC-DC converter. See, I mean, this is the requirement of DC-DC is always there because you know all your sensors inside, uh, controllers inside your uh, motor controller are working at lower voltages. So there is a need for that also. Then there is another different need to do a boosting uh, for certain of your motor control, uh, motor operating voltages and stuff like that, or else stepping it down. So you've got a no difference maybe between, is it for your internal operation? Is it for your motor operating points or dry, dry voltages? So what is the difference between charging an EV by grid and solar? Uh, is the charger different for charging? No, end of the day, if you're using at an endpoint, that would be different for, for charge solar and uh, for grid. It, it's just both the same at the endpoint. Are you hosting sessions and modeling in EV part and battery in EV? Yeah, 
I think if you would know the SQL Server web extensive uh, platform in embedded solutions. Uh, so I think yeah, we've been training involved with Kratos, uh, Formula Manipal, and a lot of other student, Formula student teams. So I think you can just write an email to contact at the Decibels Lab. Maybe we could just look through that and you know we we'll come back to you on that. So for sure, don't know right now. I can't commit anything, but yeah, you could just write as an email. All right, guys. I think that's pretty much from my side, and uh, I've answered most of your queries. Uh, please do drop your feedbacks. And uh, was it really be honest and uh, be brutally honest? Let me know if it was useful, and you know if it is if it if it made a sense for you to be in the part and spend some time with, with us. Uh, that that way we'll keep our sessions you know uh, uh, better in the future too. Yeah. So that's pretty much from my side, and uh, just just the feedback time. You know, uh, drop your feedbacks in the chat box and let let me get something uh, in a three sixty degree way that you know we could improvise in some points. Yeah, by the way, keep your interest, keep yourself focused, be focused in some areas, very specific areas. Don't be like, you know, uh, who, who just knows vibrations and, and stuff like that. Maybe get deeper, uh, get what industry is trying to look for. So if you are, then obviously, you know, industry want to pick you. I mean, definitely we need better engineers. Uh, performing engineers and, and there is no way you if you're having a skill competency and uh, also certain communication skills um, yeah why not for sure you are the first person to get picked right so true that's definitely true always so skill matters nothing else so good keep keep it up and keep it picking up your direction and start digging out where you want to start in if you want to start and keep it going so all the best uh, everybody for for joining in and uh, thanks a lot for giving an opportunity to share our knowledge. Um, keep yourself going um, and uh, let's together bring a better ecosystem uh, for electric vehicles in India and let's contribute together to make it more possible of a sustainable mobility dream. Thank you very much and good night everyone. Uh, take care, bye-bye.